All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic, and I'm excited because we've got a fantastic topic and guest lined up for the show, so I'm just going to chill and absorb as much information and knowledge as I can over the next half hour or so. Well... That sounds fine. You know, Nathan, here at Copywriters Podcast, we pride ourselves on having unconventional guests with unique marketing ideas. But our guest today, John Williamson, really takes unconventional to a whole new level. John lives in an undisclosed location on the side of a mountain in Scotland. And over the last 30 years, he has generated millions of dollars and sales for himself and his clients with his own special brand of unique selling propositions. He's also come up with an innovative copywriting concept he calls emotional lock picking. I find it fascinating and he'll share it with us today. Plus he has loads of other money-making ideas. I promise you haven't heard from anyone else anywhere else before. One of John's favorite quotes is all things being equal, people buy on price, which is why your number one job as an entrepreneur is to ensure that things aren't equal. Probably related to that idea is a speech he's given over 250 times called how to charge higher prices than your competitors and still win the business. I'm eager to hear what John has to say as you are, but I know of no higher calling then first to remind you that copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use and what you hear on this podcast. Most of the time, common sense is all you need. And if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, John, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks ever so much, Dave. I mean, you guys are amazing. The voices on you. Can you hear the voices on the both of you? Um, yeah, that's that's kind of like so- trying to see my own eyeball with without a mirror. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. I've got voice uh, envy. <laughs> <laughs> voice envy. Hey, that's a that's a first. Um, you do know how to coin a phrase, don't you? Well, <laughs> look, let, let's let's dive in because I know you've got so much good stuff. Um, attention, right? Attention. Um, you say you say correctly that for a marketer today, the most scarce commodity in the world is attention. Not only is less and less of it available, but it's becoming more expensive for a business to get the attention of its prospects and customers if it can get that attention at all, but you have spent years developing unusual and unusually profitable techniques to get attention. And the the first thing I'd like to ask you about, if if you will, is emotional lockpicking. That seems to work pretty much like drawing iron filings to a magnet. Uh, could you talk about that? Wow. So we're going to go deep. We're going to go right in at the deep end with emotional lock picking. So you're absolutely right. I mean, it's all about attention. And what I figured out years ago, David, we're about the same age, are we not? I'm like my late fifties. You must be like similar. I'm 68 and a half. Oh my goodness. If I'm doing so well when I'm your age, I should be so lucky. Well, well, listen, here's what I discovered going way back when I first started to learn about marketing. They gave us the formula, the formula, attention, interest, desire, action. And I, I looked at that, I learned it, and I thought that's a good way of framing any kind of a marketing message, any time of a marketing campaign, I'll use that. But as time's gone on, that's become untrue. The actual formula still holds, but the attention bit is now to the power of 10. We now need to fight aggressively hard, and nothing happens until we get that attention anymore. So I've spent the last 30 years pretty much, pretty much focused entirely on the attention end of the thing. And then I work with massively capable people who do all the other stuff, the conversion afterwards and all that kind of thing. But usually my focus is on that very front end of things, that how do we get the eyeballs? Can I interrupt a question? 
that seems like it was unusually prescient of you because 30 years ago it was not as hard to get attention i mean it it, it it's kind of like a copywriter who focuses just on headlines you have focused so much on attention did you know it was going to get tougher and tougher or did you just think that's where i should put most of my innovation yeah i'm a bit of a showman david so uh attention is my like i wake up in the morning thinking about attention i wake up in the morning thinking about how do we get the eyeballs how do we get those earlobes like that that's where my brain starts with so um yeah that's my natural place to be so getting that showmanship i don't know if you guys have ever done uh perry marshall's marketing dna have you done that M martial arts um no perry marshall saying? marketing dna oh perry marshall i Perry's a friend. I'm familiar with this stuff. I don't know marketing DNA. I'm familiar with 8020 and some of those stuff. Did, but a don't. fantastic psychometric test for people like us in this industry, specifically for people in this industry. And when I did it, it said literally in Perry's own words, be a showman, go out and do more of it because that's what you're good at. So, so the showmanship actually, you know, fighting for that attention, PT Barnum style. Well, um, you know, that's where I come from. That That's my thing. I've always graduated towards that. So uh, that's how things like emotional lock picking came to be. Uh, when I, I started to discover that traditional headlines were starting to work less and less, um, that people were being hyper educated with formulas and things in the industry. And as I saw that, I, I, I saw an opportunity there to start creating, designing headlines, which were uh, more freestyle. And they were working more with the, in, the, the internal conversation that were people having rather than us projecting our product and service benefits onto people. From, from the conversation we've had before, it seems like these freestyle headlines pretty much came out of your emotional lockpicking process. Is that right? 100%. Yeah. And we could talk a little bit about that if you want, because the emotional lockpicking process is super simple. It's based on the concept of um, speaking to the six best customers, patients, members, um, clients of any business, just the best six, not 12 or 20 or 100 or whatever, just six. And if somebody can give me their six best, and obviously best is not just, um, it's just not um, an outcome of revenue or something like that. It can be all sorts of other things applied to, to discover what that six best is. But if they can give me those, I can hop on a call with those people. And through the process of critical emotional lock picking, which is just a, um, a, um, a therapeutic way of getting people to talk about themselves, about getting people super, super relaxed. So they stop talking about what they, uh, they're not using the conscious brain, they're using the subconscious brain to describe their world, to describe what's going on with themselves. Because we all know that um, people buy an emotion and back up their um, purchase decisions later with logic. I mean, that, that's been around the industry since the 50s, 60s, 70s. That's the way it works. Um, but most people don't actually know what to do about that. They don't actually know what it means other than like playfully trying to tie emotion into the copy. But what I've done with emotional lock picking has gone really deep, like really got inside people's heads to discover um, what that looks like. So, um, I mean, I can give you a classic example. We've got the whiteboard here. I know this is going out on podcasts, but we can talk through this as we're doing it. And if you'd prefer us to do a, like a live demonstration of what that looks like, David, we can do that. Yeah. You, are, are, okay, are, so, you going to, are you going to bear my unconscious mind before all our listeners? Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> well, hopefully it's going to resonate with you. Hopefully you're going to go, man, that makes so much sense. And I can see why that would work. And so okay. um, you said correctly before that, you know, unique selling proposition was my big thing. And for, for many years, I did nothing but seminars on unique selling proposition. So I, I'd go all over the country doing seminars specifically for 90 minutes on how to create a unique selling proposition. And this was for the, the small business community who really, really struggled to, to be able to define and differentiate themselves from the competition. And 99% of the time, they, they're in a David and Goliath war. Like there's, there's always people that are bigger than them. It's national brands, it's big local brands, but there's all, that little guys always struggling against everybody else. And so what I eventually ended up doing was doing these seminars and people would come up to me afterwards and tell me their stories. And, and one day, remarkably, a guy came up to me after the seminar and said, uh, I just want to let you know that we've got our unique selling proposition cracked. And I thought, well, that's interesting because like, I've been doing these seminars for years now. And the amount of people that come up to me afterwards and say, I figured it out. I've got my USB sorted was pretty much zero. Like it's the big thing that people struggle with. So I said, OK, I'm all ears. Show me. So he invited me down to his business. And when I got there uh, with great flourish. He ushered me into his showroom. It was a kitchen remodeling showroom. He ushered me in and he swung the doors open and then opened up his arms with, 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 with great showmanship and said, here it is. What do you think? 
And I looked around and I said, very impressive, but specifically, what is different about this compared to anybody else? And he said, John, look, look at what you're looking at. We have more full size kitchens on display in this showroom than pretty much anywhere in the whole of the UK. More kitchens right. on display, 32 full size kitchens on display. I mean, man, that is that somebody's really gone to town on that. So I said, so how's that working for you? And he went, well, it's not really, if I'm going to be really honest with you. And that's why I got you here today, because here's what's happened. We've just become pretty much the best free showroom for all of our competitors in the area. Because what people do is they come and check out our showroom, um, find out what, you know, what's available in the market, find out what, what, uh, you know, all the different styles are and, and, and what the configurations could be in our fit. And then they wander around all the other shops. There's like 13 in town and they go and price shoppers against everybody else. So we've just about become the free biggest, best showroom for all our competitors in, in the industry. And that was his <laughs> USP. <laughs> that was his USP. Okay. So that just goes to show how wrong you can get it and how, in, how expensively wrong you can get it by going for being the biggest, the cheapest, the fastest, all that kind of normal stuff. Okay. And so um, I said to her, okay, well, what we need to do is we, we need to be contrarian about it. We, we need to, as you, as you hinted before, we need to go backwards and really look at what's going on here. So I said, can you give me, and this is going back quite some time. So it wasn't just six people then, but I said, can you give me some of your customers to talk to like some people that bought kitchens off you um, in the past six months? So he said, sure, no problem. So he, he gave me a bunch of names. Uh, they were all ladies as it happens. And I picked up the phone to these ladies and I'd say to them, uh, would you mind just taking uh, 10 or 15 minutes to talk about your recent experience of buying a kitchen? And they'd say, yeah, absolutely not a problem at all, uh, but you're gonna have to be quick because I'm just about to take the kids to school or I'm just about to put dinner in the oven or something like that. David, an hour later, I'm saying to them, did you not have kids to put in the oven or something? Like, <laughs> they don't want to stop talking. Like, like yeah. I'm their new best friend. Like, they crave, yeah. they crave somebody who's going to listen to them and, sure. and not, not judge and, and not, not dive in and out, but li literally yeah. listen to them and encourage them with their conversation. And man, they told me all sorts of stuff. Like, these ladies would tell me about like the next door neighbor who was having an affair with somebody. And nobody else on the planet knew about it except her. Please don't tell anybody else about it. <laughs> Why don't she tell and you? <laughs> and insane. I've just got the knack of when I get into these calls of relaxing yeah. people and, and pretty yeah. much almost always people say at the end of it, I'm not like this when I'm doing these calls, obviously. Okay. I, I yeah. get on my couch over there. I'm really laid back. Um, I put my hoodie on, you know, so I changed my persona completely, but I yeah. really engage them. I've got this, this knack now of being able to get people to talk very freely and openly about stuff. And what I don't do in these calls is interrogate them about the purchase. I don't interrogate them about the purchase yeah. of the kitchen or anything. I let that free flow, but I'm talking around it. I really want to know about something I now call the emotional decision making syntax. I want to know at a emo deep emotional level, at a subconscious level, what is the, the decision making process? What in what order did they go through that process to come to a conclusion? where they buy, because we all know if you've been in copyright for any length of time, that people don't buy based on what we say to them. They buy based on what they hear themselves say to themselves because of what we said. They sell right. themselves. They always sell themselves. Yeah. And so what I really want to do is I want to get, I want to get that last couple of minutes, that conversation they had with themselves. I want to grab a hold of it. And, and basically what emotional lock picking does, it gives you a transcript of that conversation. Now you're going to go, that's impossible. You're going to go like, like seriously, you can't get that deep. You can't get that accurate with it. Here's what we find. doesn't matter what the product or service. When we interview those six people, it's like they were six throughputs or something, you know, at birth, all separated. They all think the same way. They talk the same way. The mannerisms, the behavior, the attitudes or opinions, the beliefs, exactly the same. If we were to take a random bunch of other people who bought, they'd be completely different. We're looking for the best. And this is super important, super important because we can get exponential growth by focusing on marketing, on acquiring 20% customers, those ones that bring the most business, the most revenue, the most joy, whatever it is we're trying to bring into the business. And so in this instance, uh, here's what happens. They start to say things because I freed them up and they were saying things like, I'd always hated that kitchen since the day I moved in. Wow, like hate. 
David, I don't know about you, but to me, a kitchen, if it's got a hob and it's got an oven and it's got a fridge in the corner, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm good to yeah. go. Yeah, I, I don't, it works for me. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. But these ladies were like using that word hate. And so I'm really interested in that. So I'd go deeper and deeper and deeper with that. They'd refer to the kitchen that they were now living with and probably been living with for two or three or five or seven years. They refer to that kitchen as her kitchen still, the previous owner's kitchen. Massive hmm. disassociation. They probably paid half a million dollars for the house, including the kitchen that came with it. But as far as they were concerned, it wasn't mine. It was still hers. Like, uh, insane. Uh, wow. So once you get to that level of stuff, then I start to put pieces together. And what I discover is that every single kitchen purchase is a as a direct resu result of moving home. So it doesn't mm. matter whether somebody buys the kitchen the day they move home, like they swap the kitchen and get a new one remodeled, or they do it seven years later. If it was on the day, it's because they had the money. Yeah. If it was seven yeah. years later, it's because they had a shopping list inside their head of other things they had to get done in their life and those took priority and yep. where they took priority yep. is in the subconscious because the subconscious is nothing more than an emotional goal seeking device. So the subconscious will arrange and rearrange that list at will like that fast. But once it sets it in place, it goes, you ain't shoving it for no, no reason. You can use termination and self will to try and move things around the rest of it, but it has complete control of what's what the money is going to get spent on whatever. And so, what I've discovered over the years is this, and this is the magic behind emotional lock picking. In one ad impression, not seven or 70 or 130 or whatever they tell you on Facebook now, in one ad impression, you can get somebody to rearrange their shopping list. So in this instance, that kitchen that was a seven or a nine or a 14 in front of it were get a new car, go on a special holiday, uh, put the kids through private, whatever. Like none of us have got all the money we need right now to do everything we need. Is that true? Mm -hmm. None of well, us. Apart, apart from you guys, like you guys are probably like, like Oh yeah, go. I'm just, <laughs> exact. you know, the reason my shoulders are so stiff is I'm trying to hold all the stacks of bills from filling up the screen. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's super important that that we rearrange the shopping list because what we said before about, you know, our job as marketers to ensure things aren't equal. The number one thing we want to do is we want to make sure that a shopping list is in our favor. We want to make sure when they wake up in the morning that we're at the top of the list, because here's what happens in any given marketplace. It doesn't matter whether it's accountancy or, or holidays or kitchen remodeling, doesn't matter. At any given moment in time, only three to 7% of people, just three to 7% of people are buying. Now we sort of all know that instinctively. But when I was doing lots of seminars, I'd actually test this in the audience. So you know, there'd be 100, 200, 500 people in the room. I'd say, who here is thinking about changing their account in the next six months? Three to 7% of people put their hand up. Who's about to change the car in the next month? Three to 7% of people. Who, it doesn't matter what the question was. It was always three to 7% of people, which tells us that 93 to 97% of people aren't buying at the moment. They are going to buy at some time, most likely, but on their shopping list, your products or services are three or seven or nine or 20. So the proof of that whole point is what I'm just about to show you now, just about to show you how we can, and we've done this for all sorts of businesses. So this is just an example that hopefully pretty much anybody can wrap their head around because we've all got a kitchen and most people have remodeled. And when I do this in front of audiences, uh, it's really interesting to see uh, the ladies or uh, the, the smiles that come on the face when I give this example, because they all relate to it instantly. And the guys are sat there really puzzled, like looking around the room thinking what just hit me there? because it, it, it just illustrates how the subconscious works differently for the male and female and also in relationships. However, let's, let's look at this specific situation. So I'm just going to use the whiteboard. If you're, uh, if you're on a podcast here, I'm going to draw up an advert. Okay. So, um, here's what it looks like. On the top of the advert, there is a big sale flash. There is also a big starburst. It says 50% off. We've got a picture of a lady stood in her kitchen, like, look at my new kitchen. And then down the side, we've got freebies. We've got free fritting, free units, free dishwasher, loads of incentives and things to try and motivate people to come into that kitchen company and buy. 
then we have a logo. Uh, now, if anybody is watching this on video, uh, just because I can't draw doesn't mean I'm not good at this stuff, okay? That's just the bit I'm not good at. <laughs> Okay, fine. I, I, I can see what you're doing. Yeah. So here's what happens in this instance. Most people, if you're fighting for that three to seven percent of people who woke up this morning and are intent on buying, like they've gone through the awareness and they've done the research, you know, you, the old classic marketing stuff. They've right. gone through all that and they woke up this morning thinking, yes, I'm buying. They're in that three to seven percent of group. The reason why most people have to use the freebies, the incentives, the discounts, the deals, the uh, all that kind of stuff to get attention is because they're fighting, they're fighting for that attention with everybody else. Right. And so what, what emotional lock picking enables you to do, it enables you to stop, to step out of that space and appeal to that 93 to 7% of people and get them to rearrange the shopping list, which means, and this is a brilliant bit, that all your competitors don't even know these prospects exist at the moment. Right. What you found out in your emotional lockpicking through a very relaxed 10-minute uh, conversation that turned into an hour conversation is that these women have moved their homes and moved into a new house, and they feel like they're in the old owner's kitchen or the old woman's kitchen, right? Previous. Not old, but previous. Okay. Just, just, just wanted to bring everyone up to speed on that before because I... I think I know where you're going with this, and it's so brilliant. I want to set it up well. That was a really good clarification, and 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 that appear that 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 scenario play appears in lots and lots and lots of different business situations. So let's draw up a brand new advert, okay? A brand new advert which is based on the emotional lock picking. It's based on the the insights we've gained from those conversations. Now, as usual, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the punchline before we move on. The punchline is this. This new advert I'm just about to show you generated 300% more people in the showroom than the previous advert. Mm -hmm. 300%. We routinely find when we do this for people that they get a 300% uplift in uh, responses at the front end of their funnel, whatever that might be, whether it's you know people over the, uh, in, over the door in a showroom, whether it's people registering for a webinar, whatever. Now, I'd like to say that you know that's because we're so smart, but it's because we're, uh, we're actually hitting on the 93 to 97% of people and changing the shopping list. So that's the reason why we get this uplift. It's not because we're so, so brilliant copywriters or anything, yeah? So in this instance, we have an advert with a massive, massive... Um, picture at the top and, and I think David you and I are both fans of Ogilvy going back aren't we yes we are yeah so you look at this ad layout here I, I'm still using Ogilvy's ad layout like and I've been doing this for 30 years and it's still my default positioning so we have a big uh, a big picture at the top David Ogilvy didn't even know what Instagram is and his ideas still work Oh man, <laughs> old school is the new cool, right? <laughs> I love it. Old school is the new cool. All right, please keep old going. Old school is the new cool. People keep saying that about me, David. Like seriously, people keep saying you're old school, and I'm like, yeah, and it is the new cool. So listen, here's what we did here in this instance. We have this footballer's wife's kitchen at the top. So this in in your parlance in, in America, that's probably like a a two hundred thousand dollar kitchen. It's somebody who plays football for one of the major major football teams something like that you know and if, if there's going to be a kitchen in a national magazine it's going to be their kitchen it's got two ovens it's got three kitchen sinks it's got stuff hanging from the ceiling it's everything totally aspirational and then underneath we have something called a that's me statement now this is what we replace the traditional headline with it's called a that's me statement so we don't do the normal headlines the that's me statement comes directly from the lips, the mind, the subconscious of the people we've interviewed. And then underneath that, we have over 700 words of text. Now, like, this is brilliant because like, I'm talking to long form copywriters here today, right? Yeah. So I don't need to sell you guys on, on, you know, copy length does not make the difference. It's whether it's interesting or not interesting, relevant or not relevant, all that kind of stuff. But most people will swear blind that the less copy you have, the more bullet points, the more freebies, incentives, discounts, all that kind of motivation over there, the more people are going to get into your showroom in this instance. Right. 300 more people came in here. No incentives, no freebies, no discounts, nothing. Just the that's me statement. So let me share with you what the that's me statement was in this instance. Yes. It simply said, ladies, 
are you fed up living with someone else's kitchen? Oh, man. You know, it's like you're Robin Hood shooting right into the heart of it. I mean, with your arrow. Um, yes. Or Cupid, perhaps, might be better. Cupid, hopefully, yeah. And, and here's what people were saying, David. They were coming in the showroom saying that advert could have been written for me. They, they were yeah. literally walking in saying, I was reading the newspaper the day, and, and I wasn't looking for kitchens because kitchens was number 18 on my list. I've got, like, a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff to spend my dough on. But yeah. they read that. The subconscious picks it up, the reticular activating system. It yep. picks it up as one of its low low hanging goals and it goes that's us and then it goes i want that emotional goal fulfilled now she turns awesome. to her husband she nudges him and she says i think we should go look at kitchens this weekend and he's like what do you mean i thought i was getting the new bmw in two months <laughs> no. it's time we got the new kit do you see where we're going with this yeah so it's super 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 powerful and what you'll notice one of the things that you'll notice more than anything else is that most of the that's me statements we do have a away from motivation. So we know from all the psychological research and studies that people are more motivated to avoid pain than gain pleasure. Right. Yeah, that's just a given. Right. But what do most headlines do? They're talking about what you're gonna get, what how good it's gonna be, like how improved yeah. life's gonna be, like how you're gonna feel better. What 80% of our, our that's me statements are, are away from motivation. So in that instance, are you fed up living with somebody else's kitchen? We sink them into that feeling. The next oh. sentence is, are you fed up living with somebody else's kitchen? A kitchen you inherited when you bought your home. They're like, they're like, out, like, this is me. Like, I've not even mentioned this to anybody. Like, when I put my head down on the bed at night, I don't even think about that. And I think about a lot of other stuff, but I don't even think about that. And how did you get in there? Mm -hmm. And so when you reflect that back to the marketplace, there's tons, tons and tons of other people who literally have that thought in their head. Of course. And so the whole concept is, um, if you like, this is a pattern interrupt. Mm-hmm. So whereas most headlines are not pattern interrupts, they're trying to sidle up to that three to 7% of the market or in the market for what you're buying and to say, here's a good, jolly good reason why you should choose us rather than somebody else and all that kind of stuff. This yes. is a pattern interrupt because they're not expecting it. And then bang, out, out of the blue, completely unexpected. Yep. You know, th this is brilliant. And, but we're, we're running a little short on time and there, you have one concept I'd, I'd love for you to, um, switch to if you could which is egoic labels i thought that i i saw a, a post you did in a private group i'm on on facebook and i thought oh, man this guy wow you could even give the example about the accountants that you gave there if you want and the numbers yeah it's just fantastic we can do that quickly that's that's a quick one to do but egoic labels again are a, a really cool way of getting into the psyche of people really understanding that that you know the one of the identities they have because we all have different identities like i don't know about you david but when I walk away from here right now and I go see my lovely wife through there and I go see my kids, I'm different than with them than I am with you. Yeah, you get that, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Same here. And I'm different with Josh, my business partner. Like we have these identities which are suitable and supportive of what we want to achieve in any given moment, etc. So we've done a lot, a lot of really deep work on identities, but egoic labels are very clever because they literally enable you to take one or two words and get yourself an instant uplift in response rates, predictably, predictably. Because what we're actually doing is we're, we're, we're looking for what somebody's state of mind is when they start to read the copy, and we're looking to change the state of mind. We're looking to make their state of mind receptive to what we're just about to put into them. So um, in that particular instance with the accountant, we'll use that one. I've done a lot of work with CPA. CPA has always been good to me. We work well together. They're always introducing clients to me. So it's been in my interest to be able to get their attention and, and to bring them closer to me and have relationships. So at one stage, going back many, many years, now I do it differently. I do it with apples. And, and hopefully some other time, maybe on another podcast, I can do the apples presentation for you guys. But um, I used to send them a letter, 240 word letter, something like that. Um, one page single, basically suggesting to them that it would be a good idea to sit down and have a coffee. And I would routinely get a 7% response rate to that. Send 100, get seven phone calls, off we go. Traditionally, we all know that the more accurate the uh, salutation is, the dear Mr. Smith or dear Phil or whatever you're going to use, 
that's going to get you a better response than dear accountant. I mean, that, that's what everybody tells us. That's, you know, it's, it's the norm. And back in the day when I was doing tons and tons of direct mail, that was actually provable. One day I got really lazy because, you know, it's my nature to, to try and find the shortest route between A and B, like make yeah. it easier. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to have to go through all these manuals and, and pull out accountants' names and correlate them. And then and I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to write dear accountant on the letter. And we mailed it. Guess what happened? Same response rate. <laughs> CPAs don't care. They don't care. They're like, yeah, that's me. They, they don't really don't care. And so I, I started. Yeah, I, I, I remember an accountant told me, I don't think in words, I think in numbers. Yeah. So they told me. Yeah. But basically, that's it. They're just, just an open slate. So here's what happened in that one particular instance. I started doing all this work on identity and I started to play around with developing uh, some mapping stuff for, for egoic labels. And I thought, let me try something because I'd had a conversation, I had loads of conversations with accountants, the ones that I'd got to, and I was able to do some basic emotional lock picking, like not, not intentionally, but just whilst I was there with these guys. And what I discovered was most of the accountants, most of the accountants were frustrated entrepreneurs. And you can imagine that, right? They sat in front of swashbuckling entrepreneurs all day long, uh, you know, showing the bank accounts to the accountant and showing how much money they're making and how much, how many, how much nicer their car is and how many more houses they've got and all that kind of thing. And the accountant's sitting there going, I could do that. I'm a smart guy. I could do that too. And so here's what I did to that letter. I simply inserted the word entrepreneurial, dear entrepreneurial accountant. That's all I did. Didn't say it didn't change another word in the rest of the letter and it nearly doubled the response rate. That's that's amazing. And not just that, David, but this here's the most important thing. The quality of those leads when I got to them, so much more improved. Because their state of mind, they were trying to project into, I'm that entrepreneurial guy, so I'm gonna behave like that entrepreneurial guy, and I'm going to I'm going to try and fit in with what you see me to be like if I am genuinely an entrepreneur. So they stepped up. Does that make sense? They weren't as cautious. They weren't as restricted, reserved. They were actually trying hard to match up to that egoic label as an entrepreneurial accountant. So it changed everything. And we got like loads and loads of examples of egoic labels in, in funnels, in, in, in um, book funnels, in all sorts of things where just adding a couple of words like that, um, it's a super easy quick fix. Like everybody I've, I, I ever talked to, if they've got a funnel and they're looking for a quick fix, I go, let's stick an egoic label in the headline. Above the headline is a slug. Get it into the intro sentence, whatever. But it, it's quite often just like an instant win. You know, I am thinking there were a couple, at least a couple other things I wanted to talk to you. And I think you slipped in a embedded hypnotic suggestion that you might come back for another show. So um, what what I'd like to do is is talk to you later about all of your proprietary USP formulas, if, if you're open to that, and, and your elevator pitches, how you close the business in seven floors in a lift. Um, yeah. Would you be open to doing that? Hundred percent. I, I love sharing this stuff. I really do. And, and like the Facebook posts we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, it's so encouraging for people to come back and go. I took that little tiny idea you gave me. I went out. And I got six clients that week, and I'm like, how cool is that? I mean, it's it's just the best thing ever. So, um, yeah, you know, when you get to this end of the game, like our end of the game. It's more about seeing what other people can do with it because we, we've done a whole bunch of sure. stuff ourselves. So I'm at that stage now. So I'd love to share more and more stuff. That I'm super open to that. Okay. And uh, just got to promise us that your beard will be as long then and as, as it is now. It better be longer. Oh, longer <laughs> even. That's right. If it's growing, <laughs> duh. Excuse me. Okay. It, it better be longer. <laughs> Nathan, what do you have to say? Uh, first of all, I'm going to have to follow you on Facebook. I don't think that we've connected there. Second of all, it feels like you gave so much away and, and there was so many just jewels of information in this episode. And at the same time, it also feels like we barely just started scratching the surface. So I second David's request. I really want to have you back on to continue this conversation. And in between now and then, if there's people listening and they want to find out more about you or they want to follow more of your work, where is the best place for them to go? 
by public demand. And, and I, I'm not even joking when I say that. We've been hassled, Josh and I, over the past couple of weeks to, to set up a Facebook group. So we set up a private Facebook group. If you search Attention Bandits, oh, search Attention know. Bandits Facebook group, and uh, we'll let you guys in there. And, and that's where we're going to be sharing tons and tons of this stuff. And, and Josh is a genius. Like, you know, I, I'm the showman, but he's the professor. So he's the guy that really picked up on all the work I've been in for the past 30 years now. He's going really, really deep on, on really layering the psychology and stuff like this so that we can actually share it and teach it to people in a more efficient, effective way. So, um, yeah, we'd love to see you guys over at Tension Bandits. Yeah, you, you just gave me a new idea, which I'm, I'm going to you know, pilot um, field test for the first time here. Every professor needs a showman. There you go. And mm. every showman can also benefit from having a professor. So true. 100% true. <laughs> All right. John, thank you so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. And I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. We look forward to having you back. And for you listening out there, if you want more episodes of this podcast, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and share the shows so that you aren't the only person enjoying them. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later. Thank you. Thanks, John.